everyone, I've brought you back out again to underneath the macadam nut tree which is flowering this week. There's quite a few nuts there. That one looks ready. And anyway, I brought you back out here because I didn't tell you some of the stuff I wanted to show you in the last video as well. So I brought you back out here again. And we had that Antarctic wind, it's just blown the bamboo. I thought, I thought there was a lot of bamboo here last time. Change times first, but I pulled out the big blanchetti under that so it was gonna pull out of the bed. Pull out of there, cleared that, and sort of keep them all the medium ones. It's a bit better, but yeah, there's still a big clump over there, which I want to show you around in there soon. And yeah, bamboo everywhere after the winds that we've had. So now it's blowing a gale. So that's what I wanted to tell you all. So we are 90, um, almost 100 meters above sea level, okay? So we are not down in suburbia or in some valley or anything. We are 93 meters above sea level, 305 feet above sea level. So when it's windy, it's always much more windy. I find like I sometimes, or like last year, not so much this year, but last year I would drive down um, onto the coast into suburbia and it's just a completely different climate. And I'd be really surprised to find that it's blowing a gale up here and then when I drive down to suburbia, it's just like a gentle breeze happening. So that was the first thing I wanted to tell you. It can get pretty extreme. Um, and so yeah, I just wanted to give you an idea that we're 100 meters above sea level, which is kind of cool because it opens you up to new kind of mountain growing <laughs> as well. So what I wanted to talk to you about last time was how I came to have some of the species. This is where it all happened for me. I was trying to show you because I didn't have the shade house. Was I said to my one of my Brom friends, that I would love one day to be able to make a bromeliad, like name one or how fantastic it must be to name, you know, name, have a, or just to be able to make a bromeliad. So my Brom friend said to me, well, why don't you collect a lot of species for now? Because I confess myself, I wasn't ready to be trying to make some kind of new bromeliad. At that stage, I thought, yeah, well, why not? Why don't I just collect a lot of species like Gigantia and Fosteriana? And then I wanted to show you, I couldn't resist a lot of hybrids back then. So this is a beautiful hybrid. And this is speckles, Frisia speckles, had a long time. And you know, I had that terrible hail storm in the garden last year. So I'm not sure, but it could also be that scrub turkey. Um, I'm always chasing him out of here because he's got a sharp thing on the scrub turkey and he just, um, like backs up and scratches towards your broms and like it can either be him or it could have just happened. There's also the, a chance a branch or something from the neighbor's tree fell. So this is the second generation of Gigantia and it's going a little bit narrow too which makes me think oh maybe it's flowering but um, sometimes they just do go a bit uh, narrower during the winter time. Here. So maybe not so much in the tropics or something, but here some of the some of the regions sort of slow down and go a little bit narrow. But yeah, I shouldn't think that's going to flower because the parent of it took years to flower. So I think it's just still growing. So speckles a beautiful hybrid that comes from some of the beautiful species. And yeah, more under the tree, more hybrids as well. And no, I don't have them all in order. And I don't have all the species, but there is a hieroglyphica at the back in there actually. I didn't collect all the species, but I tried to collect as many as I could. That's what I'm trying to say, okay. And when I first learned about the Brom registry, and I first chose my favorite Brom, it was really hard to choose. I said, well, I love acneas because they're just, perfect for sun um, for landscaping and sun hardy and all that sort of thing and but I can't resist some of the freesias both the hybrids and the species are just beautiful and yeah that's sort of how it all began anyway I went to the registry when I was fairly new and I'd gone to the Florida the Florida website when I was new and I made this fantastic list of all these acne species that I was going to collect in alphabetical order. It took, it took 
two days to write this list out. Anyway, <laughs> when, I, when I eventually found out a lot of them weren't even in the country, uh, people like Grace Goody and that have so many other breeders in Australia that have made so many good broms that don't feel bad that I couldn't get all the broms that were on my list. A lot of them, you know, um, most people didn't have them either. So that was my first learning curve. So yeah, you can make up a big fandangle list of all the species you're going to get and then find out some of them you can't even get in your area. That's all part of the learning curve. So I find if the mother was sort of happy with the position then the, the pup will sort of just try to grow in the exact same position and just sort of consume the mother, which is kind of cool. So you don't even really have to clean up the mothers. Whatever's left just kind of blows away. And that's just how they sort of grow in the wild is they just, um, the pups use up every bit of energy they can from the mother. So it's all good. And then with speckles, lastly, I wanted to show you how speckles looks in the shade house. So I put it, a, put a speckles into the shady side of the shade house, not the sunny side. It could have gone in the sunny side, but there was no room left in with all the acmeas and um, sun, sunny neos. But it went into the shady house and it's not as, not as good, I don't think. So. That was one of the things that got me to plant these ones was talking to someone and a chap said to me the breezes like more light than what you think and the breezes will take more light than what you think so that's when i really started to plant some in here so i've taken a lot out i can tell you exactly which ones i took to the shade house i took some of the slow growing ones like sundasai i took some of the hybrids i took red chestnut um, some of those ones I took down to the shade house but I just want to show you right now what speckles look like with shade and how much different it is when it gets a lot more light it's way prettier still kind of dark but I guess the leaves in the shade house are just kind of dark like that and also it's flowering too so it will have more color So that's how speckles looks in the shade house. And so just a couple of more things up here before we leave this area. I wanted to show you this sort of the Brescia rockery. And this is sort of bamboo corner, except now there's three more bamboo corners. So, and then there's all sorts. It does do really well out here too. Beautiful big ones. I have a beautiful burgundy flower. Hybrids, uh, kiwi ones, kiwi cream, kiwi dust, kiwi kiwi in there. And then I had a lot of the smaller species, smaller breezy species I had hanging in beautiful hanging baskets um, under the tree to begin with. And I took a lot of those baskets down, or some of them even climbed out of their pots. All sorts of things happened after a few years. But I wanted to show you now how this garden looked when I first began. So I'm even going to show you, I'm going to show you the bamboo corner and under the macadamia tree. And I want to show you all those little breezy species, like some of the smaller ones that I had hanging in the basket. So here we are under the same tree and see all those beautiful baskets. And I had bronze in little logs and ferns and there was a bit of a pathway and everything was sort of all beautiful and in its place to begin with. And then they just sort of grow everywhere where they want to grow and then their pups go this way and that way and, and that's how it looked in its former glory when it was all set up and new and, and gorgeous. Back when I thought I was going to get the golden shovel, win the golden shovel from Burke's backyard. I'm just keep it stunning. And then bamboo corner and where the ghost, the ghost bamboo is pretty big small one and then the small hedging one over towards the macadamia nut tree. I want to show you now, you won't believe this corner. A couple of palm trees, start of a bamboo. And then I often talk to you about there being nothing much in the front yard. So back here back here I had the shade of the macadamia nut tree but there was nothing much with the big date palm, bit of Monsterio gelicio under there. And now there's our and pygmy 
jates and things like that. Alright, let's get out of here. So I want to go and do some of my chores I'm getting behind with, like the ears just flying past like we're on warp speed or something, but I'm getting behind in my chores. So we're going to go now and we can still talk about Brahms, but I've just got to do something you can talk with me. We're going to go and collect some fruit because you're supposed to get the fruit off after the last frost and it's getting too late and the fruit will all spoil on the tree, so we'll go do that now. So it's all good when you just have Brahms, but when you have um, a garden full of other things, it's just so many things to do. So we'll just pick these oranges together and have a little chit chat. And yeah, I normally get them off a bit earlier, so it'll still be good though. So they should come away pretty easily. If they don't pull away too easily, then they're not quite ready. Some of these will still ripen up. I actually thought I left them on, but I think they're good. So that last frost that they get is what kind of sweetens them. So the... And I love picking orange fruit particularly, because it reminds me of my ancestors who used to be market gardeners and grow fruit and things like that for years. And also my French heritage back in France, they used to grow beautiful citrus. And it's just such a good thing. It reminds me about when they didn't have enough oranges on the ships out here and they all got scurvy, which is pretty sad. So some beautiful oranges for summer. We can keep in a few more weeks. Spring and summer. There's some particularly nice ones. Not too many duds this year. And not too many bugs, you know, nothing's really... I think just one mark. I'm pretty happy with those. <laughs> Lots of flowers, which is a good sign because where the flowers are on your citrus is where the fruit comes, fruit grows. And the first couple of years I grew this tree myself, so the first couple of years it didn't bear much fruit. I feel like this is like almost like a bumper crop. It feels like a bumper crop, guys. Go along with it. So, that's all good. And it's a Valencia. Valencia orange. Beautiful thing to grow. Maybe you can grow it on your neighbor's side. Share oranges. This one doesn't want to come. I might have to get the ladder. So we'll just get the low down with sweet ones. Yeah, so there's just something really good about picking food. <laughs> and there's nothing better than having your own orange juice. Pretty cool, making your own orange juice for breakfast. Yeah, so there's not too many pests, which is good. Because you can get these some kind of fruit wasp or something that burrows into them. But the leaves are quite by the way, this is the possums get them. There's a couple of possums around here. I'm sure some of the animals are the ones we'd get them to if they could. It's like that scrub turkey. wearing gloves because they can be a little bit ugly where right where you pull them off so you don't really associate citrus tree being a little bit quickly but you pull in a couple of dozen off they can be a little bit prickly. Alright that's probably enough. So thank you for watching today and as a special little reward I'm gonna let you in on a top secret top secret around here. Guess what it's happening it's happening, year of the COVID. No, I nearly cried.